I'd like to welcome back to the stage Chef Alejandra Schrader for a closing speech about eating for tomorrow. Please give her a round of applause. Well, I have a lot of pretty pictures. You're just going to have to use your imagination. I know food insecurity. It is a concept that I was exposed to very early in life and that forever changed my relationship with food. Being food insecure shaped my perspective about food access and nutrition equality. Next. <laughs> I was raised by a single mother in Caracas, Venezuela, despite being highly educated and working really hard to provide the best life that she could to my sisters and I, we still experienced a lot of financial hardship. Many nights there was simply not enough to eat. Most available foods in our home were high in calories, but low in nutrition density. It was very common to have an arepa, a corn cake with butter for breakfast and perhaps pasta with cheese for dinner. Wholesome foods were often out of our price range. Looking back, I sit in gratitude for all the mangoes that fell over people's fences and laid on the sidewalks as I walked from, from school back to home because sometimes that was my biodiversity. But here's my reality. The lack of access to nourishing food and good eating habits have had a lifelong effect on my health and my development. At a young age, I was diagnosed with gallbladder disease and severe anemia. I have battled with obesity my whole life, and at my heaviest, I weighed 456 pounds. I have also experienced the serious consequences that food insecurity has on mental health and also on well-being. Having struggled with food access and experienced malnutrition is precisely what propels my passion for wholesome and nourishing food. This is why I am so grateful to be an ambassador for the Periodic Table of Food Initiative and to be here at this monumental time and celebrating such an extraordinary milestone for the initiative. Next. I know food is medicine. I transitioned into a plant forward diet over five years ago in my lifelong battle with morbid obesity and extensive attempts to all the possible diets out there. I wanted to try something more extreme as some of my metabolic markers had become highly elevated. So I focused on the concept of eating the rainbow and began to incorporate as many varieties of edible plants into my dishes. After only 90 days, my cholesterol and my triglycerides level went down from high to normal, and from then on, all my other metabolic markers, including my blood pressure and my blood sugar levels, reached optimal levels. Then, after only 17 months of improving the quality of my diet and eating intentionally to maximize nutrient density, my body surprised me. Next. Although I had been told that I couldn't have children, <laughs> I spontaneously became pregnant with my first child. Everything that was expected of a woman of my age and my BMI, preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, and others did not show up in my pregnancy. I delivered a healthy little boy after 42 weeks of gestation. I was 47 years old. <laughs> Plants have been good to me. I am living proof that good food has the capacity to heal our bodies and help us thrive. As part of my work with the Periodic Table of Food Initiative, I create delicious, colorful, and nourishing dishes that promote food biodiversity. Along with the traditional culinary creative process, I like to consider the benefits that each ingredient may bring to the plate and that may carry for physical and planetary health. How can I incorporate more, fi more fiber or fermented foods for gut health? Or how can I enhance the inflammatory, anti-inflammatory properties of this dish? Should I add a little bit of curcumin or olive oil? I must admit that I became teary-eyed <laughs> and then did the happy dance with my two-year-old son the day a couple of weeks ago that I received a text directly from Dr. Selena Ahmed, the director of the PTFI, to tell me that the data was coming in and that my food had healing, I'm gonna quote this, healing properties off the charts. 
It was so exciting. It was so exciting because I had known this in my gut. I just didn't have a way to prove it. This is why the PTFI is so powerful. Next. As a plant-based nutrition certified chef, I have experienced the challenging of accessing science-based sources of information depicting food composition and their underlying dietary traits. While doing the due diligence for my first book, The Low Carbon Cookbook and Action Plan, one of the greatest obstacles was precisely the lack of standardized nutri nutritional information. Many chefs and advocates of the food is medicine movement will benefit from having access to the PTFI's public in-depth database of food composition information. I know the power of food waste. Next. In the midst of Venezuela's worst humanitarian crisis of our history, I remember the first time that my mom shared on one of our daily conversations that people started to use plantain peels as a substitute for meat. Plantains are one of our biggest staples. They are affordable and accessible. So finding a way to utilize the peel just made so much sense. And I immediately had to try it. I could not believe the taste. The peels absorbed so much flavor from the aromatics and the shreds became wilted to perfection. I knew it wasn't our traditional shredded beef, but I could have been fooled. A culinary approach born out of need in times of crisis helped people food, put food on the table. From what I tasted, there was no sacrifice in flavor. Some of you may have tried the plantain peel tostada downstairs, and hopefully you will agree. <laughs> that is what sparked my interest in food waste. Slide. When I talk about food waste, I'm not really talking about the box of leftovers that it's probably still in your refrigerator all the way in the back. I'm talking about peels and greens and stalks and seeds and so much more. I'm really curious about the culinary applications for the food scraps that a chef or a cook produces during preparation of ingredients to make a dish. Finding ways to upcycle these ingredients could just make such a difference. Claims of the health benefits and medicinal properties of food waste have been made by indigenous peoples in Latin America and other cultures for generations. In Venezuela, for instance, indigenous peoples have been using papaya seeds for their anti-cancerous properties to fight infections, to improve digest digestion and kidney function. Some science-based sources corroborate that papaya seeds contain powerful antioxidants, fiber, and heart-healthy fats, but more comprehensive data is needed. Corn silk, another ingredient traditionally thrown in the trash, has been used in Chinese and some indigenous cultures like Native American to treat a variety of ailments such as heart disease, prostate illness, and malaria. Science-based data suggests that corn silk is indeed rich in magnesium, which has anti-inflammatory properties. Other studies have found a link between the consumption of corn silk tea and a lower cholesterol, as well as improvements in metabolic syndrome. Next. Discovering the biomolecular composition of food waste ingredients could have so much potential for nutrition equality. These are PTFI dishes, signature dishes, and they, in some of them feature food waste ingredients. They have been analyzed at the lab, and although the results don't really surprise me, I am so thankful that science is unveiling the potential of food waste. And why exactly do I want to cook with trash? A study from 2018 indicates that food waste accounts for around one quarter of the greenhouse gas emissions generated by food, which represents 6% of global emissions. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations estimates that, and I quote, when integrated into a country ranking of top emitters, food waste will be the number three after the United States and China. Throwing away food means dumping valuable natural resources such as water, energy, and more. The FDA says that in the United States, food waste is estimated to be 30 to 40 percent of the food supply and that around 133 billion pounds of edible food every year go to waste. 
the project drawdown says that reducing food waste could be among the top three solutions to reduce heat trapping gases. There's not much that consumers like us can do about food loss, what happens along the food supply chain post-harvest during the processing, packaging, and transportation. But food waste occurs on the consumption side of this food systems chain when edible and good food go unconsumed. It is estimated that around 50% of food waste happens in people's homes, as opposed to restaurants and commercial kitchens. So by minimizing food waste in each of our homes, we could make a big difference for the planet. Next. I know the importance of biodiversity. As we have discussed today, there are over 30,000 varieties of edible plants. Most people around the world rely heavily on 15 to 30 of those crops. And there is an alarming fact, which Fao I talked about, estimates that just three staple crops, rice, corn, and wheat, account for two thirds of the world's food supply. We're doing a horrible job at honoring the vast variety of food that Mother Earth has made available to us. Too many crops are underutilized despite their amazing taste, nutritional density, and planet-friendly properties. I am so excited that PTFI database is already incorporating forgotten and underutilized crops and bringing them back into the mainstream food systems. Cooking can be a powerful tool to help promote biodiversity, but also to build a greener planet. Chefs and cooks are in a unique position to carry this message. Our platform gives us the ability to steer food trends, to educate people on sustainable consumption habits, to promote the importance of regenerative farming practices, and to advocate for the livelihoods of farmers and artisans. Slide. Each of us can be drivers of food biodiversity. Demand for food biodiversity at the table can drive biodiversity in agriculture and food production. Each of us has the responsibility to enrich our culinary palate and to incorporate new edible plants into our diets, our family recipes, and comfort dishes. I encourage you to step out of your comfort zone and get adventurous in the kitchen. Pick a new ingre ingredient next time you go to the farmer's market or bring home a new grain or a pulse maybe from the bulk section of your supermarket. Grow a new herb at home and find creative ways to cook with it. Next. Food is at the center of global challenges linked to public health and well-being, agriculture and biodiversity, the environment and climate change. So the food we buy and the way that we eat it has a deep impact not only on our physical health and individual ca carbon footprint, but also on food systems and the supply chain. So how do we eat for tomorrow? As I hold my son, I understand the importance of food for his physical and mental health. I also understand the importance of food for environmental soundness and climate change. I wanna promote a way of eating that would help deliver a greener planet and more sustainable food systems for him and future generations. To eat for tomorrow, we must get to know food at a different level. Dr. Selina said that the, that the biomolecular composition of plants is their language. We must get to know that language so we can figure out data-driven applications to, to solve issues of access, health, and climate change. Next. We must ensure that good food is accessible to all, especially to black, brown, indigenous, and people of color, disadvantaged communities, and marginalized populations around the globe. We must embrace food as our medicine. As we eat for tomorrow, we should empower people to reap the benefits of the healing compounds that biodiverse foods have to offer. We must minimize food waste and know the practical applications it has in, in and out of the kitchen. Yes, composting is great, but as the PTFI data confirms, the nutritional density of some food waste ingredients is very high, so why not make the most and the most delicious of it? Next, we must work hard to inspire people to find suitable ways to consume a wider variety of plant-based foods. Our future plate should be bright, 
colorful and diverse. It should feature heirloom varieties, wild and forgotten foods, upcycled food waste, and it should specially include my favorite climate-friendly food group, which is legumes. Thanks to the, P the PTFI for helping us celebrate food and for making the data available for the world to get to know good food. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chef. That was amazing. <laughs> Chef Alejandra's personal and professional story is so inspiring to me. Um, there's a joke that I cry at every food tank event. You almost got me, but now I'm doing it. So thank you for all of your work. You are the perfect ambassador to the PTFI, so I just want to thank you again. Um, now everyone will have the chance to choose between a few different options to experience a different part of the New York Botanical Garden. But before I share instructions for us to go our separate ways for a little while, I want to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. Please give yourselves a round of applause. I want to again thank our partners, the New York Botanical Garden, the Rockefeller Foundation, the American Heart Association, Food EDU, the Alliance of Bioversity and SEAT, the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research, the World Food Map, the CROV Foundation, Fourfold, Atria, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and Verso Biosciences. A huge thank you to Mode Events, who are behind the screen over here, who've done such an amazing job of producing today's program. And thank you to the entire Food Tank team, my co-founder Bernie Pollock over there, uh, Kenzie Wade and Elena Seeley, who are just amazing to work with and inspire me every day. Um, as I mentioned, everyone now has the option to choose from one of three uh, tours, a tour of the Edible Academy, a plant walk, or the library food book exhibition. And uh, just a quick note to all of the attendees who are, not, who are, who are staying for the science uh, workshop, you must attend the tour of the Edible Academy. I hope that made sense. So, um, so those attending the Edible uh, Academy tour, which again includes all science workshop attendees, will walk to the Edible Academy with Sujata Jaggi, and I'm mispronouncing your name, but please raise your hand, um, from the New York uh, Botanical Gardens Foundation Relationship Team. So where are you? You're over there, see? Okay, great. Those attending the plant walk will, will, will leave Stone Mill, where we are right now, with Tess Kurasina and Alex McElvey. Tess and Alex, raise your hands. They are right outside. Once you come up, they're going to be right outside. And then Danny, just to help you out, anybody that's going on the library tour, you're going to board the tram. So the tram is your tour guide. Thank you. And that will be with Tegan, right? Yes. Awesome. Thank you, Fallon. And for, those, for everyone who is not attending the science workshop, we ask that you please bring your belongings with you. So thank you all again, and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Bye.